President Bola Tinubu today doubled down on his hope message to Nigerians, insisting that better days are ahead. Tonight, we focus on education agenda of the Tinubu administration. The Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman, will be our guest. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. Happy Eid of Fitri celebration to all our Muslim brothers and sisters all over the world. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Tonight, our focus will be on the education agenda of the Tunubu government. What have they done? What are the indices telling us? What are their plans? What have they achieved in the last nine or ten months since coming into office? We'll be speaking tonight exclusively with the Minister of Education, Professor Tahil Maman. But well, before we get into our conversation with the minister, let's tell you what happened today in Lagos and in Burundi State. The President Bola Tinubu has joined the rest of the world to celebrate uh, the end of Ramadan and mark the Eid al-Fitri celebration. Today, he joined some eminent citizens and other Nigerians in the Eid prayers in Lagos at the Dodan Barracks. And afterwards, the president spoke to Chanlis and uh, he doubled down again on his open message, insisting that better days are ahead. The kind of uh, resilience, sacrifice, endurance that we have, we should preserve that for the country. The kind and be cheerful giver love our country better than any other country that's the only one that we have and we must continue to pre protect the integrity of our government and leadership the new hope is alive well and fine and uh, nigerians will continue to be very hopeful without hope there's no salvation. Without hope, there's no development. Without hope, there's no life. Well, that was a president, Bola Tinubu, in Lagos, and the Dodon Barracks, where he observed the Eid prayers earlier today. Let's take you to Bruno Emeduguri, precisely where the vice president, Senator Kashim Shetima, led leaders uh, in the state, including the governor of the state, Professor Babangana Zulum, and all the citizens there to pray in his home state, where he's also asking Nigerians to support the government and believe in Nigeria. Take a listen to the vice president. We are quite excited. In Mubarak to all Nigerians, let's pray for peace social harmony and development of our dear nation that's our prayer and that's our best wish all right that's the vice president uh kashim shetman i hope that you all are enjoying your holidays and uh, the feasting with family after 30 days of the ramadan period all our prayers for our nation and all your families will be answered well we get down to our conversation tonight but before we get to do that with the Minister of Education, let's get to see some of your political roundup stories. Former Vice President and Presidential Candidate of the PDP in the 2023 presidential elections, Atiku Abubakar, has called on Nigerians to support any federal government policy that is designated to alleviate the sufferings of the poor. The former Vice President spoke to journalists after observing the Eid prayers in Yola. He noted that though he is not in support of some of the policies of President Tinubu's administration, which has brought hardship to Nigerians, he is asking the government to be sensitive to the plight of the masses by providing necessary support to alleviate poverty. The only way we can overcome this 
uh, is uh, to work hard and also to support government policies that are designed actually to alleviate you know, the sufferings of uh, you know, the poor people, particularly the common man. The Minister of Works, David Omai, has responded to the criticisms coming from former Vice President Atiku Abubakar on the cost of the Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway. The minister said despite the high cost of the materials in the construction industry, the administration has maintained prudence, cost effectiveness, speed and quality in the delivery of road projects. The minister described Atiku's analysis as a gross misrepresentation of facts and figures and a ploy to mislead Nigerians by darkening counsel without knowledge. The governor of Imo State and chairman of the APC Governors Forum, Senator Hopo Zodima, today hosted leaders of the Muslim community in Oware, the state capital, in celebration of the end of Ramadan and the celebration of Eid al-Fitr. The governor asked Nigerians to use the opportunity of the occasion to promote unity and peace in the country. As Muslims in Imo State, we must be united. As Muslims in Nigeria, we must be united. We must seek for and pray to Almighty God to unite our dear nation. And the head of the governorship primary of the All Progressive Congress in Ondo State and aspirants of the party, Senator Jimo Ibrahim, has met party members in Iloluji, Okibo, local government area of the state. Senator Ibrahim was accompanied by the chairman of Aseyori Movement, Senator Omotayo Alaso Adura, and some other leaders and members of the group, and promises to transform the state and provide employment opportunities for the youth. Uh, uh, let data from the grassroots front load to us. We make this one and send it to the Secretariat of a APC with the receipt of payment for their financial deal, and then they will qualify to vote. The legal team of the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Namdekanu, is threatening to pull out of the trial if the Department of State Service, DSS, refuses unfettered access to Mr. Kano. They made their stance known during a press briefing with newsmen in Abuja. His lead counsel, Aloe Ejimako, said they will not participate in a process that will bring injustice to Namdekanu. He lamented the DSS's denial of Kano's team to have access to him, thereby making it difficult for them to prepare him for his trial. We will refuse to be participants in a process that is geared to pre-program the injustice on the head of Mazin Nadeka. Let that be clear. Thank you so much, everyone. So let's get started with our conversation. Our program tonight delves into the heart of Nigeria's educational landscape. We shall be speaking with the Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman. Today, we have the exclusive insight into the state of education under the stewardship of the Tinubu government, as Professor Maman sheds light on the government's transformative plans, so they describe it, in elevating the educational system to new heights of excellence and equity. So much plans that the Tunubu government says they have, but how much of that have they been able to deliver? So now we navigate through this conversation and we will explore the intricate tapestry of challenges that have woven themselves into the fabric of Nigeria's education sector, from infrastructure deficiency to curriculum reforms and from teacher capacity building to digital inclusion. I'm being joined by the Honorable Minister for Education, Professor Tahe Mama, thanks so much indeed uh, for joining us tonight and happy year the victory to you. Thank you, Sean, for having me. Thank you so much indeed. The glory is there. Thank you. Let's begin our conversation. The statistics are staggering. I mean, we, the education sector in Nigeria is not in the right shape. If you, if you, if you look at uh, a lot of the indices, first and foremost, look at the number of out-of-school children about 10.5 million, which is one of your agenda that you've said that you are hoping in the last six months, you said there are a number of them that you have taken out. 10 million, according to UNESCO, or 10.5 million Nigerian uh, children are out of school. It also said that 60% of primary school age children in Nigeria are enrolled in school, telling you how devastating uh, the younger children are in this country. The, the statistics also show that 60% of primary school teachers in Nigeria lack the minimum qualifications. What about infrastructure, Professor? It shows that 30% of students in Nigeria meet the minimum proficiency levels. And the World Bank estimates that 40% of our public schools in Nigeria lack basic amenities. Talk about underemployment. A lot of our graduates 
employers are saying are not even fit for employment. So many challenges. And I know you are working yourself into what is an avalanche of problems. Let's begin with the out-of-school children. 10.5 million. Those are the figures UNESCO is giving us. How much has this government been able to take out of the streets? Well, I don't want to go into the issue of figures, whether it's 10.2 or less or more. But the fact is that we have millions of Nigerians who are supposed to be in school and who are not in uh, school at, the, at this point in time. And um, we are addressing, first of all, that problem of figures. And I'll tell you how as we move on in the, in the program. It's one of the four anchor pillars you know, we have come up with to, for us to know in the first place, how many people do we have out of school? Um, and then girls, boys, that kind of stuff. It's sort of for once we settle the issue of uh, data in the education sector, if not the whole country, but at least in the sector that I'm, uh, we are handling. But what we've been able to do in the last six months since we came on board is to enroll up to two million plus. Uh, out of school through uh, a number of about three, four agencies of the ministry. And you know, uh, as a fact, that uh, we have an agency set up specifically for that purpose, uh, and Marjorie and out of school. Uh, it's yet to take off fully uh, because we are still waiting for waivers from the head of service for recruitment and even secretariat. And, 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 uh, so there are still some headwinds in terms of the takeoff of that agency, but we have not been resting. So we have, as I said, um, slightly over 2 million children, you know, being handled uh, in that, on that score. And then uh, our plan is to ensure that we address the issue of out of school, but at the same time, close that tap that is actually throwing up uh, students out of school because uh, I like them out of school to a pool of water and uh, if you clear that pool of water and then you are not able to close the tap which is actually feeding that pool then you are not solving the problem so we are working on two track policy of uh, addressing the out of school and then uh, try to close that tap mm. Uh, the Almagiri system, and if you look at the education statistics yeah. and the disparity, you see that northern Nigeria is actually on the, on, the, on the back foot in terms of educational development in this country. And the governors and leaders in the past in that region had also uh, agitated, saying that there is a major challenge that needs to be fixed in the northern Nigeria. The Almagiri is good. There are some governors who said they want to scrap it. There was a lot of effort under the Jonathan uh, government. What has happened to that system? Well, I am, again, not going into uh, projection of what the governors will do or not do, because that is really their terrain. And they are entitled to adopt policies within their states. But one thing is certain. If my view is sought on that, I think it's quite possible to have the two systems integrated. And uh, to me, that's the best way to, to go. And uh, we are having conversations with the governors. And I think soon, even soon after the Easter break, we are going to engage them. Uh, because yeah, secondary education, almost 90% actually is within the domain of states and local governments. Federal government uh, has only the unity schools and some of the technical colleges, um, a few of the, some technical colleges. And, and that's the, all that the federal government is directly in charge of. But... And the tertiary uh, education. Of course, and the tertiary education. I was just referring to the basic education level. But for two reasons. One, because of the acknowledged problems in that sector, in the basic education and secondary school level, the problems have come back to the federal government. And then secondly... Uh, which is also right, the education national minimum standards and the establishment of institutions confer on the federal government through the Ministry of Education powers to set minimum standards for that level of government from pre-primary, primary, primary sec all the entire education sector. 
So through that window, the federal government has a responsibility to ensure that uh, minimum standards are met in the delivery of education at all the levels. And so it's through those windows, you know, that the federal government now have to come in. We have a crisis at hand, and it's a national crisis. The federal government cannot just wash off its hands and say, well, this is a state matter. No. But, but as a minister, yeah. honorable minister, uh, would you be proposing for a scrap of the Amajiri system? I, I, I wouldn't. You I want it to be, to be matched? It's, it's possible to do, Does it work? Because there are a lot of the downside to the Amajiri system. Torture, yeah. uh, force, um, no, what, discriminate. No, uh, no. What I'm focusing on is the education. Yeah. yeah what but talking, those would criticize yeah. the manner in which the education uh, is that, being delivered. That can be reformed. That's quite possible. Because, I mean, this is a, a generation age we are in now where there's information. Uh, people can know everything that is happening around them. And I tell you, in, even in those places that have been able to integrate them uh, successfully, you, know, you could see the value of it. These children coming up with good, sound moral values, you know, embedded in with their Western education. So they, really, there's no conflict between the two of them if they are properly integrated and implemented. Mm. Because you see these children, uh, today, they, they will see how they are bows in their hands yeah. on the street and hoping tomorrow they will return to the imaginary system, but they never return because yeah. they, are, they are still used to the begging and they're getting all of this money and they're carried away by it. And those who yeah. think that it is not working, it's just a, a, a facade to say you want to integrate. But if you look at no, it... No, where, where you have a successful integration, mm -hmm. those things will not happen. Because those children will be fed, there will be provision for wash, sanitation, water sanitation, where they are. And then even those who teach them, those the, 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 the madams and the teachers who teach them, they also benefit. But they have even curriculum for it. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, it's an Arabic yeah. system of uh, education yeah, exactly. that has been integrated into the Western system of exactly. education. But exactly. well, is it standardized? Some that of is, these teachers and that is what clerics are using their own yeah, templates. No, this is where the standardization comes in. You know, once that one is done successfully, then all those ones will be mm -hmm. out of the window. Because I understand, yeah. and I asked earlier about the system the Jonathan government put in place. That is dead, isn't it? I'm not sure that it, you ever met it in your office. No, I, I didn't mean it. Certainly, I didn't mean so it. So it, it, yeah. it died naturally with the Buhari government? Well, what we have are the physical structures and the here and there, and that's what we are using. We are going to we've set out to use them. But it's not in existence any longer, philosophically and ideologically. That Jonathan system that he created, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of fanfare about what it will do, but uh, it, it is not in existence any yeah, longer. In my, to my understanding, there are some states actually where they exist, like Borno, for instance, and uh, one or two other states. They've been able to have that system in a more fine, integrated way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the school feeding program was one program that was uh, created to also help uh, to yeah. to lure the, the children to school when they know uh, that they have this opportunity to get the food mm. in school. Yeah. Uh, but with what is happening with the Humanitarian Affairs Ministry, is the school feeding program still active? Well, it is not active. The president has suspended it together with some of those policies that came with uh, that program. And um, But I remember we are still waiting for the final decision on it anyway. But I, I remember um, his statement that it would be reverted to the Ministry of Education, where in the first place it should have been. Uh, so whether the committee will recommend for that policy to be formalized, that's another matter. So we are waiting for that decision. But it's a, it's a fantastic policy. It's been shown all over the world to work to strengthen enrollment rotation and completion of schools. But if you have your way, you want it to be reintegrated? Yes. That's what I it works. Though. It works. What does the statistic tell you well, about the impact of school feeding program? Fantastic. It's great. Where it worked, it was a reason for students to come back to school or, re or remain in school. So it's, a, it's a very laudable policy, and the president has said he wants that policy in place because it serves a huge purpose in keeping the students uh, in school, uh, bringing them actually, even if it's just to get one million a day, 
you know, for a lot of parents, it makes a lot of, uh, you know, economic sense. And, and then for the country, it's, it's, a, it's a major driver for enrollment and uh, for them to uh, stay and continue with their education. Let, let's go into uh, what, uh, uh, and some of the lecturers will be looking at me uh, mm -hmm. right now, watching intently to see what you will say about labor issues and welfare of teachers in the higher institution in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We have eight months under the Buhari government that university lecturers were sitting at home based on the, on the, on, on the rift between the federal government and the university lecturers and uh, um, uh, over payment uh, and some other issues. Has that been totally and 100% dealt with? The issue is settled in relation to academic staff. But there are still issues outstanding in relation to non-academic and technical staff. So the government is looking into that. They have blamed you for it. The As, Sanu and Nasu, they I said, don't. for <laughs> four know. months now, yes. they have a backlog that have been approved by President Tunobu for them to be play, paid alongside their academic staff colleagues. But from your office and the office of uh, the Accountant General, there is a missing gap and they have not, and they've threatened strike They've gone on warning strike and nothing has been done. I think Sanu and Nasu, they all know I am one of them in terms of, uh, they have my sympathy in terms of getting what is due to them. They know that. Uh, and we are doing everything possible to get a relief for them. When do you think that they are formed? I mean, what is delaying their, mm. their, their emolument? These are money that have been approved anyway, so no, why is no, it not no. being paid? No, no, it has not been approved. But they feel that it has been approved. I've spoken to no. the president of Sano twice, who think that the money has been approved, and they are wondering no. what is the no, late payment. No, if we can stop at the level of communication problems, I will agree with that. Uh, but it requires... You remember, the whole foundation for that was there is a court judgment, you remember, you know, uh, on no work, no pay. So uh, the ASU getting four months pay was actually a discretion. It's a discretionary decision on the part of the president. And uh, so it doesn't automatically transfer. But the matter is already under consideration. That's, to me, uh, I think it's a very positive. We are on a positive uh, progression on this matter. When do you think that can be sorted out, the payment? Uh, I, I, the the four-month backlog. I don't think it's safe to put a time on it. It's safer to say we are on it and we are pushing. I, I, would you say that uh, we have come... And in any case, yeah. the non-academic staff, they were not on strike for, for, uh, for the same period with the academic staff. Yeah, they were not. Yeah, they were striving for about four months or so. So if they are getting 30 payments, it's going to be half of that. Mm. You know, if the president will follow his uh, president with the academic staff. But they are saying whatever they have been approved, nothing has yet right. been paid. Yeah, we Even if it's it. not up to the eight months <laughs> of the academic staff, whatever yeah. it's uh, accrued to them has not yet been paid. So they feel yeah. that there are two different manner in which the government is dealing with university staff, either teaching or non-teaching. No. And they feel that they rated or they rate the government of the day rate the academic staff more than the non-academic staff. No, no, nothing, I, I don't, that, that cannot be right. And there's no rating. I mean, these are people who are doing within the same terrain. Every person is just doing something different, but they are all working towards the same goal. Uh, I, I believe what happened was a communication problem, actually, initially. That was what led to this. It wasn't a deliberate step measure to exclude them from that benefit. It wasn't. Prof. Can we say for sure that under this government, the era of ASU strike is over? That's our hope, and we're working on it. That's our hope with the unions, and uh, that's our understanding also with them. And since... The president has clearly stated, expressly stated, that one of his desires is the education sector. Teachers, children can be in school. You know, we can have some uh, order in the education sector where people can come to Nigeria on sabbatical and uh, there's stability, people some planning. You know, anytime there's strike and instability, there's really no planning in that system. 
and you have students instead of three graduating three, four years, taking six, seven years. And uh, so the president is very serious about his desire to have stability. And uh, we've had a number of interactions with the unions. And uh, of course, we share with them their aspirations for the education sector, particularly the tertiary education. You know, there's not about, no doubt about that. And they understand too that we share the same aspiration. It's just that sometimes uh, unions have some a lack of understanding of what's possible and what's not possible at a particular point in time, uh, which those of us in government have. Uh, but we also uh, committed ourselves to doing everything possible to support the system. That's the most important thing. If the system is supported and uh, being given what, is, what, what it deserves, and you, you can see from the budget of the ministry in 2024 how the budget went up significantly. And uh, these are all part of the support. Although it's still not up to what uh, the United Nations uh, standards are well, for, yeah. for education budget. I understand. I wish it was up to that standards, you know, but in the present circumstance that we are in. So doing less than 10 percent? Yeah, it was. I mean, the hope yeah, is almost 15 percent. Yeah, it's a significant improvement. That's, that's the most important thing. Mm. And, and the president is prepared to commit more. He has already, he has said it many times. Uh, this, is a, this is a leader who has, at every opportunity, stressed the centrality and the importance of education as an empowering tool and his desire and preparedness to commit resources, you know, to get it right. Because if we get it right, for any, any country that gets its education right, it's on the path of development, mm. you know. And any country which falters on education is damned. So he, he, he understands that he's prepared to, yeah. uh, to so support So I'm worried it. about how government is able to keep to bargains and agreements, especially when it comes to education. And my heart bleeds, especially when Nigeria uh, was faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was difficult for our nation education sector to profess solutions uh, in terms of education, in terms of health. In fact, our research institute at Moribund, mm -hmm. we couldn't even provide. In other climes, the Harvard, the Cambridges of this world, were the ones proffering solutions immediately to their immediate community. And those are some of the solutions that Nigeria, we were buying with money that we did not have. Mm. For someone who suffered long years of being in the university, um, when you say you wanted to do four year course, you spend more than that. I entered into, uh, in, in a year that there was a, there was a uh, ASUS crisis, and one of the biggest one, the uni learning 44. Mm. I mean, it's, how, how sad this kind of scenario is. And that's why I'm asking whether this government will not never allow such dark days in our education to happen to us again, ever. This government is committed to turning the education sector around. This much I can tell you. And uh, from the policies that we have on ground at the moment, you know, we don't have any doubt that uh, we will have that outcome. But coming back to what you have said about the contributions of the sector to some of those innovations and research, uh, certainly it could have been better, but I know as a matter of fact that there are a lot of researches and innovations going on in our tertiary education sector and research centers all over the place. And uh, I had the privilege of attending convocations in Kano some two months ago, and I saw some of the breakthrough researches and innovations going on there. The same thing with uh, UNILAC. Uh, I, I saw some of the uh, breakthrough researches and innovations going on there. And even right here under our nose, in North, in North 8, you know, right there on uh, Abuja Airport Road, you'll be amazed by the research going on in, in, in that place. Now, the gap, the major gap we have shown in our system is off-takers. Mm. There, are, there are no industries out there that are interested in taking those products of researches and turning them into products like other countries. This is what other countries do. There's that synergy between industry 
and tertiary institutions, you know, to convert those uh, outcomes that have very fant fantastic potentials, mm. you know, convert them into products that are available to 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 the, to, to the sector to. To, to the citizens, this is what we, this is a very major gap yeah. because the there, is, there is that gap between the town and the gown. Yes, there is no handshake gap. between government policy and research in our universities because, and that's why they turn to Harvard, they turn to Cambridge, they turn to MIT, they turn to the the Ivy Leagues of, of this world in other climes. It's not when there is a problem, for example, it's not, it's, Prof, not, it's not lack of policy. Are there grants actually for research in this country? There are so much of it. From the federal government? Oh, yes. There's so much of money out, lying out there. From the federal government, from development partners, from bilateral, so much money out there, you know, from, for research. But as I have said, when the lecturers are researchers do their research, somebody has to take it further. Is that not the government that should do that? No, no, no. It's not because government. the benefit it's of private our research is private sector. Of course, government in some cases too can come in, but it's largely private sector that are in industry in that are actually in manufacturing that are um, you know into real processing rather than just importation of finished products. Because uh, are, prof, yeah, all having. of these problems yeah. that we're having mm -hmm. in the security sector, yes. in the economic sector, I, I mean, I imagine that. For the, you know, go, government owns universities in this country. Yes, it's a matter private, of asking the, the ministry and the NUC and the League of the uh, of the Vice Chancellors to say, see that look, put together a team of researchers, and we want in in one year, in one and a half years, let's have the solution preferred from your research on yeah. education, on health, on security. Yeah. Those are the things that I thought that will happen in other crimes. They are making landmark research uh, outcomes in cancer treatment, yes. in, uh, in AI, in technology. But in our own client, we simply duplicate and we simply <clears throat> photocopy. No, no, not just duplicate and photocopy. We want to see that are... we are now, that this is a research work from our own university. There are... Because I'm going to take you up. Yeah. You've schooled abroad. Yes. And there is a, I mean, you've enjoyed the best of the world in terms of education. Absolutely right. And yeah. you, you look at our infrastructure in this country. In fact, there is an edu uh, uh, tracking uh, 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 report that came out that not even a single Nigerian university is rated no, 1 to 10 in Africa. Isn't that sad? As a giant of Africa. Yeah, it's very sad, I agree. It's very sad, very sad. But uh, as I said, um, everybody have a blame here and there. But for the moment, at the level of development that we are in at now, there are sufficient researches out there that can actually turn things around in the country. What we need are people who are committed and bring commit their resources to having an industry, you know, that can take these researches and convert them into products. This is what is needed. We are not into production. We are just simply importing everything, even the pharmaceutical industry, which is giving us drugs here and there. They are not producing them. They are just bringing in the products and then uh, putting them together. It's a lazy country. system that we have. Very, yeah. Mm. So that's what we need to bridge. And our businessmen and captains of industry need to go into that area very seriously. But, but we need to get a commitment from yes. you. I mean, mm. you are a highly respected scholar. I mean, the director general of the law school. You've risen to the highest level in your, in your career as a, law, as a law professor and teacher. And one way, imagine, I'd like to get your commitment tonight. As a minister of education, mm. under your stewardship, how far do you hope that you can take education? We are taking education to the level that this country desires or needs. It's a promise you are making to Nigerians. Oh, 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 yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Let's take a breather, everyone. We're going to break. And when we come back, the litany of issues on the education sector, a lot of promises also by the Tinubu government. The man who is at the um, of affairs at the education ministry is Professor Tahir Mahmoud, and he's been speaking with us. When we come back, we'll be asking him, the educa Nigerian Education Fund that has been launched, how about it? Can you as a student who do not have money to go to university, can you now be able to access funds to go to school? we find out after now. Join us again, everyone.
so much, everyone. Our attention tonight is on the education sector. And the Honorable Minister for Education, Professor Tahir Maman, is being our guest tonight on the program. Thank you so much indeed, Professor. My pleasure. Um, the President Tinubu's higher education plans were rolled out in that 80-page campaign manifesto in which, uh, as a then-presidential candidate of the APC, spoke loftily about how it would reform Nigeria's statutory institution and return the higher education sector to its glory days. And that's why I was trying to get that commitment from you or how far mm. under the Tahir Maman leadership at the education sector uh, uh, ministry, what you will do. Specifically, on page 41 of the manifesto, President Tunubu said, his government will rationalize the governance structures, funding and compensation structures of tertiary institutions. And given the nation that education that it deserves, the question is, how? Well, um, as you have said, education is, a, is at the center of everything that we have to achieve in this country. We have three instruments to govern our plans for education. One, uh, the deliverables which have been issued by the president, which is being monitored by the policy Committee. Uh, secondly, shortly after we were inaugurated as ministers, we quickly worked out a roadmap that will guide, could provide framework for delivery of a suitable and an appropriate education for this country. Now, the major thrust of what we are going to achieve under the roadmap centers on three pillars, four pillars, actually. One is, first of all, for us to know, to have all the information on education sector in Nigeria. Right now, a lot of argument out there about how many, nobody can tell you uh, the number of schools in Nigeria, nobody can tell you the number of teachers, nobody can tell you, uh, you know, a whole range of data cannot be provided on education. So we are going to, for, for the first time, get that over with. We are going to have a census, a data census on the entire education system, from teachers, from schools. And you know, it's only when you have that data that you can plan, you can know issues of inclusivity, you can know issues of who are in school, who are not out of, who are out of school, uh, regional and uh, state variables, and then who are your teachers? Are they qualified or are they not qualified? How do you want to support them? Who are those who need to be supported and supported with what? So we are already rolling out our plan um, to deliver before this year runs out. It's, it's, it's a complete sense. Yeah, it's a complete yeah. census and a data mop-up. So no, but it's going to be a digital, is it a, a digital system? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We are going to have a dashboard in the Ministry of Education to know what is happening at every level. So if something happens in a school in Lagos, the minister can be able to, from his dashboard in the school, he will, uh, in the ministry, he will know. The same thing with the governor in his state. From his own dashboard in that state, he will know. From the local government, uh, the local government secretary, education secretary or chairman, whoever, can know what is happening on all the schools within that local government. That's one data we are going That's so terribly important that we have to have. Mm. Uh, that's one. Then secondly, if you look at the um, Education National Minimum Standards Act, 1985, it has laid out clearly you know, the education pattern of every Nigerian from pre-primary school to primary school, secondary school, up to tertiary level. That has never been implemented. For how long? They've never been implemented. Never? No, not at all. Because one of the things we ask in the ministry, the plan on primary school, there isn't. For secondary school, we just finished, uh, developed 
the curriculum and guidelines for secondary school. That's a primary school that we are not addressing it. We are already on it at bringing up the curriculum and what needs to be taught at that level. So we've been growing, the education sector has only been growing in terms of size, but it has not been quite growing in, 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 in a planned trajectory. Mm. So it's just like a flower that is not yeah. tended. Yeah, because a lot of people will ask, yeah. under the Child Rights Act, there is a fundamental right yeah. of every child to education. Under the universal basic education, there are the rights of the child and the duty and the role of the parent to be ensure that every child gets a basic education. And in this country, mm -hmm. uh, those who imagine that in several, in several states, the basic education is for free. But if the implementation is the problem. In other crimes, That's it's a, criminal. And there is enforcement. Even when there is truancy on the absence of a child in school, the parents could go to prison for it. Very well. But in Nigeria, Very well. all of the children yeah. are st st on the street yeah. begging, yeah. and the government yeah. is folding yeah. it, its arms and looking at it. Implementation. Mm. It's not the lack of laws, a lot of people would no, say. No, no, no. It's not, it's not a lack of law. The critical component of it is even if for the sake of it, you enforce attendance. And they go there, play, learn nothing. Technically, they have met that requirement. They've been to school. But they are empty. They cannot read. They cannot write. Or even if they read, they cannot comprehend anything. There is no spirit of inquiry um, no and, and, crit of and, cri and critical thinking. Yeah. So, so that's why we are at the stage of where, what is called, what the development partners call learning crisis in Nigeria. Uh, because our students and people don't have the kind of knowledge they are supposed to have at the level that they are. And don't and mind... That's a disaster. Yeah, it is. It's a serious Some problem. people just walk into the classroom exactly. and go back home. And go back home. And the quality checks are not there. They are simply... So we have a learning crisis in this we country. We have a learning crisis. So that's what we are addressing now. So we are taking us to the basics. This is what we are doing at the moment. And how, how are we doing it? Because of the size of... Uh, schools in Nigeria, what we have decided to do is to bring back skills, you know, and values back to school from primary school right through uh, the, the entire education sector. Skills, digitization, okay, and then uh, those values we have also mentioned, uh, you know, cultural norms, you know, but essentially... Civic education. Yeah, which is... Which are, you bring, yeah. are you bringing history back? It's already back. History has been brought back a long time. As a compulsory or as, a, as an optional? As, it's optional. No, no, it's compulsory, sorry. It's, it's compulsory. So uh, history is fully yeah. back it's full, in our curriculum? Yeah, history is not fully back. In the back. secondary school curriculum? That's right. The only problem that there is... Uh, teachers, availability of teachers, mm. you know, because when it was out of the system, um, of course, those who, uh, who read history simply were not many again, and people were not reading history again, you know, in the for, for degree. And, but now that it's been brought back, uh, the Ministry of Education did a lot of training, delivery of training through uh, online, you know, to, um, you know, inform and, you know, educate people in history again. So that one is back. But the point we're making is that when we bring up back his uh, skills into our system, and uh, especially to under digitization now, all those things that we've talked about, you know, we will not bring them back. Skills, entrepreneurship, uh, these are the things that they need to be that, that, Quite comfortable with. that will yeah. form a part, uh, as a citizen yeah. that can help form your, your psyche. I, I know yeah. that the NUC has implemented a change in the curriculum yes. in our university. That's right. That's Is it right. reflective of some of these things that you're talking about? It does. It does contain some of them. Because but, some of that curriculum but, yeah. is as old as uh, yeah. 40, 40, 45 years. And they have not been changed. But we understand now there is a change of curriculum. There is a change. NUC has brought back uh, CC mass, has introduced CC mass, and uh, with a lot of radical uh, changes in terms of entrepreneurship and uh, uh, sort of innovation, technology, and all the all brought into it now. So what we are doing now is to take the whole thing back to the primary school stage. Yeah. 
And we, are, we already developed a national skills framework. The Minister has already developed it. We are working with uh, some development partners to populate it with the range of skills which are ne needed for all those levels. And then, uh, sadly, only recently, too, the National Council on Skills was inaugurated and is going to drive these programs in two ways. One, skills in the informal sector for out-of-school uh, training and empowerment, and then skills also in the formal education sector. Remember, uh, at some point, it was also introduced sideways for those who uh, went to the University of recent sideways was introduced, but it has not been effective. Sideways has not been effective. Is, are so, you scrapping sideways now? No, no, we are not scrapping it. We are going to integrate it with uh, the current uh, program that we are developing. Okay. I yeah. mean, that takes me to even the authenticity of some certificates. There's a, an issue, a crisis of fake certificates flying here and there. I understand that the report is in the works. When will the report be ready? Well, um, I understand they are about to submit their report uh, in the next few days. Uh, the committee has completed and they are basically doing the editing work. So very soon we will have it. How bad are the, are the, is this issue of face certificates or fake well, institutions too? Well, I cannot comment on it yet because the report is not yet before me, uh, but it appears there's a problem. Mm. Yeah. That people are just taking certificates just from uh, some outlets, shops, some out, you know. Yeah. That's what we hear. Well, that's what I'm hearing too, but I cannot compare, comment on what we are hearing until we get the report. And uh, we'll tell the whole nation, you know, what, uh, what their findings are. Uh, because we are, in, we are a nation of uh, people, unfortunately, who, are, who respect certificates. So certificates will bring them from anywhere and then we give respect to them against what we are just talking about in terms of skills. People should be known for what they can, what they can do rather than just certificates alone. Mm. And that's what we are trying to address, we must address now. Yeah, I know that the government made an initial policy mm. on uh, some uh, West African university or some yeah. university. Oh, has there been a review and what exactly is that disposition of government uh, today? There is no review until the report is in. But there was an, uh, there was, uh, yeah. an initial policy about the acceptance of some certificates. Non-acceptance of certain certificates in some West African countries. That policy is still on ground. Which are which, which are these countries? Uh, Togo, um, I think Ghana, about two, three of them. So if you ask that case yeah. from that those countries, yeah. no, you... Ghana, Ghana is not part of them. Okay. It's, uh, it's uh, Togo. Uh, I think about two, three of them. I can't remember exactly now. But if you have uh, any student that we place the ban on them until this report is out, we will have... Retroactively it. or within uh, uh, progressively? Well, progressively, it has to stop from... From a particular... Well, yeah. yeah, when that matter broke out, certainly. If you look at uh, the university, uh, uh, constitution of the university councils, over several months now, they have not been constituted. Why, Prof? We are, we are done. Uh, I think in the next few days, you know, the councils will be announced. For yes, in the next few days. Yes, next few days we are done. The, the universities will have their councils. Uh, for the last two to three years, there is been a concern about uh, some teachers um, in the federal unity colleges across the country who are employed between 2018 and 2019. Uh, two to three years salary areas are being owed to these teachers. What is going on in these federal yeah. unity? Colleges. I am not aware anybody's salary is being owed at this point in time. Nobody has brought that to my attention. And but, but I mean, and if they haven't, I don't think there is anybody who has not been paid salary. No, but they, they, are, they are rare. They are, they are the ones yeah. employed between 2018 and 2019. They were owed, or they are being owed two to three years arrears in the federal unity colleges. And these are teachers who are directly saying it, those who are uh, impacted by that, by that situation? If I'm aware, I would have pursued the follow-up on the matter seriously, vigorously. Mm. But as I said, I'm not aware.
Talk to us about the Nigerian Education Fund and the Student Loan Fund. The president has launched it. You were there. You saw what happened. Yeah. The structure is on the ground. Three-man uh, panel to, to, uh, to sit on the board of that Nigerian Education Fund. When will it get on the ground and start issuing this loan effectively? Well, the management team of three have been appointed. Uh, the rest of the council will be put together very soon too. Um, I believe shortly after the celebrate, we will have uh, the rest of the council. And um, from the briefing I have so far, the team is vigorously preparing for takeoff. They know the, the interest the president has in this matter. They know Nigerians are waiting, students are waiting. So they don't have the luxury of time. And, uh, but the most important thing actually is the, uh, the act, the amendments that have been carried out. Yeah, there are still some few things here and there that, can, uh, that may require some retouching, but the frame of the act as it is now is, is, is good for them to, uh, to take off with. And uh, I believe, as the president has directed, uh, students will uh, access this money mm. from uh, this academic session. Which is supposed to start in October? Yes. October is still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So um, you will have um, oh, to wrap yes. up all, all of those all processes? All the most certainly, certainly. Yeah. All right. So, um, I mean... Uh, I don't want to dig into your past to say some of you have benefited from this, from this kind of yeah, opportunity. Yeah, I had a free education, certainly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I benefited too in the Federal University. Uh, almost free, we paid only okay. uh, talking for, for accommodation and all mm. of you. Yeah? And I mean, th those who are uh, indigent actually should be able to benefit more. Yeah. Issues of infrastructure is a, is a problem. Uh, Minister, I don't know if you have done a tour but well, you need to do a tour around the universities and major education uh, yeah, um, uh, institutions in this country. They are very bad, mm. very terrible. Classes without water, without roof, mm. without chairs, without lockers, things are really bad. It's, it requires a state of emergency. Is this government seeing it as such? Yeah, certainly. Uh, this, uh, our president understands the magnitude of the problems facing the sector, and he has also committed himself to it. And um, even without touring the universities and other tertiary institutions, especially universities, uh, on account of my previous work in the law school, and uh, especially, and some of the assignments I've been going out for, you know, to represent Mr. President during convocations. I've seen uh, improvements, I've seen problems. Uh, there has been significant improvement, actually, through TED fund interventions in infrastructure of the university. And there's been a lot of corruption in the TED fund, too. I, can't, I, I don't know about that. Uh, if Unfortunately, there is, there's no time. Yeah. I would have been able to. No, no, so no, people no. ask for transparency in well, the deployment of TED funds. Yeah, well, but what I know is that it's one of the agencies of government that is most effective in their intervention. I have seen, I have, it's one of those places where I haven't seen abandoned projects, you know, in the tertiary institutions, except probably some minor delays here and there. So it is very, very effective in mm. terms of their intervention. But as we said, there are still a lot to do. I well, wish you, I wish yeah. you would be, this government would declare a state of emergency. I mean, if you, you need to see lecture halls yes. where student f capacity is a problem. The lecture halls are not sufficient. There are no seating. But, uh, but, but you know, you know Sharon, some of these problems are not caused by the government. You know, but these are government-owned institutions, no, Prof. No, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that institutions also have responsibilities. There's no reason why, for God's sake, Somebody should have a class with 300, 400 students. There's just no room for it. Even if you have a course that has 300, 400 students, there's a way they can be staggered and arranged and, you know, have small uh, classes. You have 300 students, you cannot simply deliver. No, no, there is even no this light is for you to even use public address system. Yeah. Prof, I, I like to like put that internal, actually, internal issues. Yeah. So in, yeah. in 30 seconds, brain drain, 
is a major problem. And not, it doesn't affect only doctors and There's medical more in the education sector. In the education right? sector. Yeah. A lot of our it's bright worse. brains yeah. have left the country. Yeah. Are you worried about in 30 seconds? Is this government doing something about the issue of brain drain? Well, it's a, it's a fact. But for me, for me, what we, it's not something that we can do something about really as such in terms of people wanting to leave for other clients. What we can do is to improve their replacement in the country. That's what we need to do. That's one. Two, what we need to do is to create a suitable environment and emolument system that will stop brain drain. I mean, human beings, especially right. the intellectuals, are free-minded people, so they can go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to do everything possible to yeah. keep them here. This so that the uh, what they say about yeah. teachers' reward is no longer in no, heaven. No, Get no. your reward. Yeah. Yeah. You've been have, a teacher all your life. They have problems. They have to solve problems. <laughs> yes. Professor Tahir yeah. Maman is uh, the Minister of Education and has been talking with us on the education sector and the Tinubu agenda. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you so much. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'll see you tomorrow again. God bless Nigeria.